Uh, welcome to Thursday, September 10th, 2020 edition of the Planning Board. Thank you all for being here. Before, um, for audio participation, Colin can be accessed by any of these three numbers, and if the line is busy, please keep trying. 425-436-6308, 425-436-6338, or 425-436-6300. Access code 538960, hashtag. For video participation, HTTP https semicolon slash slash join dot free conference call dot com slash situate one follow the instructions on your computer screen to join the meeting your computer microphone will be muted you will be allowed to ask questions or comment during the moderated question and answer period following following the audio directions I will entertain a motion to accept the agenda. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in, all in favor? Ms. Burbine. Aye. Ms. Bornstein. Aye. Ms. Lambert. Aye. Ms. Pritchard. Aye. Ms. Lewis. Oh, I don't think so. Oh, there she is. Hi, Rebecca. We see you. Come here. Say aye. Say aye. Hi. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you. You're all set. I barely hear you guys. Hold on. Okay. Can you hear us now? Uh, can you hear us now? Yeah, it's a little soft, but yes. Let me turn this up. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, it wasn't mine. Wasn't all the way up. Okay. Okay. So now I'm good. I just want to let everybody know that because we are still in the midst of a COVID emergency, we don't have to hold meetings. We are all doing the very, very best that we can under the circumstances. And we're trying really hard to have one big meeting at each planning board meeting, okay? And that, so that we have enough time to do some other things that are form A's or whatever. So you all need to be patient with us as we are patient with you. Okay? That said, we now have a public hearing, a continuation of a public hearing, site plan special permit for mixed use development in the village bis business overlay district, VBOD. 14 to 16 Old Country Way. Gentlemen. Oh. Oh, the Design Review Committee. Um, Hal, is Hal there? Does he want to comment on this? Hal? He's muted. I thought I was muted. This is Hal. Hi, Hal. Do you want to comment on 14 to 16 Old Country Way? Uh, okay, so you can all hear me. Great. Yes. Um, you know, I don't have much further comment other than what's already been summarized in the uh, notes that um, I believe you've been provided with. Um, I, I'd be happy to answer questions if they if they come up but i think the notes really say it all okay but then i will read read the notes into the record the drc consensus is that the scale of the buildings is appropriate the window spacing and proportion seems appropriate drc expressed approval for the dormers and barn doors with transom expressed on the north building DRC recommends approval of the proposed development with the following notes. Include site lighting strategy in the next public presentation. The DRC suggests taking advantage of the old country way facade of the southwest building, which is actually the side of the building, 
by creating a focal point. DRC identified the kitchen window location as the potential site for bay window a figural composition. Finally, the DRC recommends that the design team consider trees on the east side of the driveway to balance the trees in front of the southwest building and to frame the development from the street and screen the neighboring property. Those are the comments from DRC. Are there any questions concerning those comments? Okay, we're all set. Okay. Al, thank you so much. We're all set. Just a, uh, just a clarification. Um, are we going to hear about the site lighting strategy tonight? Uh, we just found out about this requirement a couple days ago, so we're going to work on it, but we don't have it for tonight. They do not have it for tonight. They're working on it. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. All, right. All right, gentlemen. Oh, okay. All right. Do you mind if I Take put this down? Okay. Uh, okay, so Attorney Jeff DeLisi uh, from Warrenberger, DeLisi and Harris. I'm here tonight with uh, Paul Maravito of Ross Engineering, our architect, Lance Severs, uh, as well as my client, uh, Rob Proctor, and our architect, Kelly Connellan. Uh, and so just to kind of for uh, to kind of recap and bring everybody up to speed. Our last hearing date was July 9th. That was the first hearing uh, of this application. Uh, since then, there have been multiple um, rounds of comments from, uh, from the board's peer review engineer. There have been three additional rounds of comments and responses. Uh, in addition, uh, we've been to the design review committee as as we've just uh, learned in the comments from Mr. Stokes. Uh, we filed a substantive uh, submission with revised site plans, revised O and M plan, revised long term pollution prevention plan, etc. Um, and that was filed on the 14th uh, of, of of August. In addition, on August, uh, in August, the zoning board submitted a letter to the planning board which clarified the question on the issue of the amount of impervious uh, coverage which is allowed uh, from the uh, zoning board in their decision. Uh, notably, the zoning board's decision did contain some Scribner's errors, uh, but they clarified that they, they voted to reduce the amount of impervious area from 44%, which is what it is, it is right now, to uh, no more than 42.5%. And they also confirmed that, that uh, there is no permeable, there's no expectation uh, from the board that there would be a use of permeable pavement and, and uh, incidentally, we're not proposing to use permeable pavement. So uh, <clears throat> notably, with respect to the coverage calculations, the plans that uh, Paul most recently filed uh, on behalf of the applicant show an impervious calculation of 42.3%, which was primarily achieved by reducing the size of the building um, as well as moving of some of parking spaces. Um, incidentally, there was some discussion at the last hearing concerning a concrete strip that showed on the plan uh, that kind of uh, in that narrow location that goes out towards Jenkins Place that was a labeling error. It was intended always to be a grassy area and that calculation had been factored into it as grass. We've corrected the label. Um, we provided uh, some responses to the fire department's comments. We provided uh, an alternatives analysis, which was requested from uh, the town's uh, consultant. Um, we've clarified some of the issues on the architectural plans that showed some kind of some empty space above the center garage bay. Um, that is going to be storage of materials or equipment associated with the first floor use below it. And um, there's also a small 300 square foot area 
I think that was not labeled on the plans that you previously had, which is intended to basically be an administrative space for desk and computer and so forth. The plans have been revised, uh, and Paul submitted uh, an email indicating that none of that is proposed to be living space for uh, any of the apartments that are um, within that building. Um, so with that, uh, I can have Paul kind of walk the, the board through uh, what, has, what his highlights are on the revised plans. Okay. If, if that's the board would like. Yes. Okay. Are we working from here? Are we're going to tell you in a minute. Uh, what page, Paul? This first sheet is uh, sheet three of ten. Paul, what's the revision date on the plan? The revision date is um, August twenty seventh. August twenty seventh. I have one that says August thirty first. Yeah, that's what I have what too. It might have been stamped in on the 31st. Yeah. Oh, all right. So, but the revision date is the 27th. Well, the drawing, date, drawing index is August 31st. On the drawing. I'm being told, Steve, that, that the August 31st date applies only to the architecturals and not the. Oh, okay. 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 All right. So, that's not what we're looking at. We're looking at the. Uh, site plan? What happened to Yes, site? he's about to go over the site plan. When we shift over to architecturals, I'll let you know. Okay. Uh, wait, wait for Steve to get caught up. No worries, Steve. Take your time. When you get there, it'll be sheet three. Okay. Sheet three. Okay. You're all set, Steve? Yeah, all set. All right, thank you. Paul? Okay, thank you. You can take that off so that we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, on sheet three, above the word uh, Jenkins Place, we added a note showing that the existing uh, cement concrete pavement is to be removed. We also show the um, proposed barn building in the rear yes. to be 82.2 feet now, um, long. That's been cut back by approximately five or six feet. Um, We've also, and this week in response to an email from Karen, we show the setback of the building from the street to be 15 feet off Old Country Way, and we show the setback line to be 10 feet, which is the minimum setback in this district under the special permit provisions. Um, those are the uh, primary changes on the site layout plan, sheet three. Hey, all on this sheet, why, why, does it, why does it say 14.4 average building setback? Yeah. Steve, that's the, um, <clears throat> there are two different ways uh, to calculate the front yard setback. One is to, under the zoning bylaw, to take the average of the buildings on the same side of the street within a certain distance. Uh, so Paul, when he went through the engineering or the surveying on this, utilized that calculation and it it found its way onto the plan uh, but in actuality uh, that's only necessary if you're going to go less than what the required setback is in the zoning district but since uh, since the required setback in this overlay zoning district is 10 feet it, it's superfluous uh, because we're because we're set back 15 okay. feet okay so the 15 foot is the closest 
point to the building basically. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So Paul is now flipping to sheets and we'll let you know in a second. Paul, what sheet? What I'd like you to do is to go to sheet number four. Sheet four. Mm -hmm. Okay, go and ahead. Four. Yeah. yeah. Um, up at the top of the page, there's a um, uh, subsurface recharge area SR S1. Mm -hmm. We have pulled that away from the pipe. It's approximately four feet from that closed pipe, which is um, um, underground. Th those are the chambers okay. themselves. That recharge area is gonna accept the uh, roof runoff from the uh, residential units. The roof runoff is considered to be clean water. Um, all of the downspouts are uh, connected to that recharge system to the rear of the house. Um, it isn't shown on this sheet, but when the subject in sheets, in between the rear of the proposed units in that recharge system is where we have the uh, sewer and uh, the uh, gas main. Um, that's going to service those four units. Um, the other thing we did on this drawing, in response to the review comments from Horsley Witten, we made some modifications to the, uh, uh, to the proposed uh, bio retention area. That's on the right side of the driveway as you come in from Old Country Way. The plan also shows the uh, proposed building that has been uh, reduced in size at the rear of the property. Um, other than that, everything else has um, stayed the same on the plan. All right, Steve. That's okay with me. I think it's good that you were able to move it away from the. 24 inch pipe. Okay. All right, next, Paul. Did we ask the question already who owns that pipe? You did, ask, uh, you did ask the question at the last meeting. Mm -hmm. um, the pipe is owned by the, by the property owner, and so we're going to um, make provisions in the, uh, I'm sure you're going to have a condition of approval that the association that's going to manage the property is going to be responsible for maintenance and repair of that pipe should anything ever happen to it. Okay. Okay. And Paul has now sat down. Um, all right. <laughs> all right. So, You're all set. <laughs> ask a follow-up question on that? Certainly. Um, so the property owner owns it on his property for the, the Condo Association will own it on their property. Who owns it on the other ones? Is it all privately owned? Is yeah. The town owned it all? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no... Uh, we've been unable to find any record that the town installed this pipe or mm -hmm. regularly maintains this pipe. Um, I think Paul might have mentioned that the prior owner of this property was a longtime uh, um, skilled employee of Citro Concrete and Pipe, and kind of over, over uh, engineered this. Um, but the answer, from a legal perspective, is is absent, absent some documentation that the town properly owns it. It, it that portion of it, which is underground, under un, beneath the surface of any particular property owner. Is it the is the responsibility of that particular property owner? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's a it's a tough one. That's the first time I've run into that. Can I follow up with one question? Yes. Will there be an easement? Um, 
for the town there so if you're asking will we provide an easement within our documentation for the town to be able to access this pipe and the property to do anything with respect to the pipe the answer is yes um, and we we assume that there would be a proper condition of approval to that effect yeah, so the easement won't be shown on the uh, well the easement uh, that's a great question Karen I, I think that the easement has to be for the entire property and not just for say a 10-foot strip in width it literally would have to it would have to be that the town has the right to enter the property it might need to stage on the property and we don't want to keep it at too too narrow of an area so I'm my my plan was to draft the documents in kind of a broad way such that it would be captured uh, it could be interpreted that it's the entire property um, <clears throat> If you guys, if if you guys would like uh, to hear from uh, our architect, um, Kelly Kelly's here to answer any questions, and she could show you any changes that she might have made. Um, I'll defer to the board on that question. And I ask a question about the pipe or should I wait? Go ahead and ask. Do question. we know of any discharges from this pipe? So we know that water discharges from the pipe. So it, it's been a while since the last hearing. Uh, I believe that there are two two ends to the pipe. Mm -hmm. One end is the entrance of the pipe, which is an, um, an I think a perennial stream, Paul. It is. Uh, and it enters, I believe, on Mr. Montero's property, uh, if if I'm not mistaken. It is. It, okay, and and then it runs. On the drawing. Yeah, it, yeah, it's shown on sheet four. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see you can see. Both ends of the pipe on sheet four, right? Yeah. Um, on the right and left side, mm -hmm. and so it goes underneath Old Country Way, spills out on the mis on onto the law firm's property, uh, runs into a channel a very short distance, and then goes back into a culvert underneath Country Way, and spills out into the pond. Right. Have you cameraed this pipe? Yes, uh, okay. Paul. You could. Yeah, that's we uh, we had hired a subcontractor to put a camera in the pipe, so we could look, so we could get the slope on it and the uh, condition of it, as well as the location. That that 24-inch pipe stops at the uh, layout line of Old Country Way. Underneath Country Way, the town has a 36-inch. A uh, concrete pipe that, that goes to the other side of the uh, layout of uh, Country Way to a head wall, and from there, that's the open area of the stream that Jeff talked about, about eventually going under uh, Country Way itself. But on our property, and starting on the Montero property, that's a 24-inch um, pipe. Paul, could you just explain to the board how you how you identify the resource area from the standpoint of um, the regulations under DEP sure on the plan as we show that the um, entire property so just sort of 29,000 square feet that's all upland um, so there's no uh, wetland resource area on the property um, because the uh, pipe is actually closed and sealed within the property, that is not regulated under the uh, DEP regulations, and we have confirmed that with the DEP. Um, and the, it, the other thing is that the uh, resource areas that we are within the buffer zone to are the entrance of the stream into the pipe on the uh, Montero property. There's a inland bank which we show on the plan. That inland bank is a resource area and on our plan on sheet 4 we show the 50 foot buffer zone and the 100 foot buffer zone. Likewise on the other side of Country Way where the other head wall is where, where that 36 inch pipe ends there's also a, a, a second 50 foot buffer and a second 100 foot buffer zone that comes on to the locus 
because we are in the buffer zones of those two re of those two offsite resource areas, we have to file with the conservation commission. And and we did that filing a few months back. They have yet to open the hearing. Um, we hope that they get around to it soon, uh, and, and it falls squarely within their jurisdiction. But we're not proposing we're not requesting a variance am, am i correct paul we're no no okay the bottom line is we we don't have any unregulated resource areas on the site um the other thing we looked into because that's a uh pipe brook we looked to see if that was subject to the uh, riverfront regulations and the dep uh regs and it is not subject to it and the reason for that is because the pipe is over 200 feet in length the riverfront starts at the beginning and the end of the pipe. And what you do, according to the DEP regs, you would draw a line perpendicular to the pipe. And everything to the right of it would be in the riverfront on the Montero property. And everything to the left on the property on the other side of Old Country Way would be in the riverfront. But when you draw those two uh, perpendicular lines to the closed pipe, um, those perpendicular lines do not hit our site. Because of that, the site is not in the riverfront, so we're not subject to those regulations. Um, so again, there are no uh, resource areas on this site other than um, the work we're doing in the buffer zone. Thank you, Paul. Are you, are you, I, I, I'm just trying to follow that. Are you saying that the, the river is edge or at the man-made ditch at the existing headwall? Yes, for, for purposes of uh, determining where the riverfront is, when you have a closed pipe, I, I, I sent an email to the planning board with a diagram showing that. And what happens is in the DEP regulations under 1058, it says if, if you have a uh, you know, uh, pipe culvert, if it's over 200 feet in length, then you go to the end of the culvert on each end and you draw a line perpendicular to the culvert and if, if any of that area within those two lines falls within the locus, then that portion of the locus would be in the riverfront. But in this case here, because of the location of those, of the beginning and end of the pipe, if you draw a line perpendicular to the head walls at each end of the pipe, um, that perpendicular line does not uh, come onto the property at all. So, uh, Steve, just for your uh, reference, if, if you cared, it's uh, 310 CMR 10.582, uh, and then it's subparagraph uh, I, I think it's H and then 2, or H and then 3. And what it says is the riverfront is the area of land between the river's mean annual high water line measured horizontally outward from the river and a parallel line located 200 feet away, except that the parallel line is located and then it gives distances. And then it says where a river runs through a culvert more than 200 feet in length, the riverfront area stops at a perpendicular line at the upstream end of the culvert and resumes at the downstream end. And then it goes on to say when a, when a river contains, uh, well, it, then it talks about islands. So that, that's, that's your answer there. That's how we, it took us a period of time to uh, bore down on that. And I think you're, I know Janet's here, but I, I think she would probably agree with that interpretation. Steve, are you all set with that? Is, is Janet? Yeah, she's she, she understand she's, that too? Yeah, she's here and you know what, we're gonna put the architect after Janet. So I'm not Janet's gonna speak next. Great. Okay, Janet, are you here? Yes. Do you want do you want me to weigh in on that, Steve? Yes. Or and yeah. um yes. Yeah. I am in agreement with their definition of the riverfront. Okay. Do you want me to talk about anything else that has been done? No, I just wanted to know that um, you, you looked at this too and, and you you're concur. Yes, that the definition of the riverfront act, as he, he just explained, is accurate. 
And we're deciding to see through the color as a river? Yeah, the, the, because it's 200 feet long, the culvert itself is not a river. When the culvert, like, like if it was just the piece in, under the road, and that rest of it, then the entire thing would have been a river. If, if the culvert on the property was actually open, it was surface. Yeah. And so, and then there was just like a 20 foot length underneath the road, the entire thing would be considered a river. Mm -hmm. But because the pipe itself is more than 200 feet long, it is considered a pipe and not a river. Okay. Um, do you have, you. Janet, do you have anything else that you would like to add to what we're doing here this evening? Are you all set with what they've done? I, um, I can, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. You're very quiet for me, so that's why I'm like, I feel like I'm, I'm jumping into my computer. Um, so just for the record, so my name is Janet Bernardo, professional civil engineer with the Horsley Whitney Group, and we provided a peer review letter after your July 9th hearing um, on July 27th, and that review was basically kind of what we talked about during that hearing. I kind of hit some of the bullet points there. And then the applicant responded, and we wrote another letter dated August 26th, which is relatively lengthy, 36 pages, because it has um, all the different references for the different peer reviews associated with it. Um, the applicant responded to that one as well, and we have a fourth letter that is dated September 2nd. That, um, and in that September 2nd letter, I, I just kind of went to the three comments that were still outstanding um, in our minds, or that had been outstanding after the August 26th letter. So August 26th, they made a bunch of, um, they made a number of um, adjustments and responses, and our September 2nd letter, basically there's three outstanding issues, well, I don't think they already responded to some of them. The, um, so one of the items is the number of parking spaces in the barn, and that was, you know, we kept kind of asking for where are the parking spaces in the barn because there are seven spaces that were allocated in the barn, and I couldn't quite understand how they were being laid out. There is an architectural plan that is dated, I guess, August 31st. And it shows these seven parking spaces in the barn, but it looks slightly funny to me. So um, I wanted to defer that to the planning board for your um, determination of if those are reasonable parking spaces or not. Um, then there was our, our other comment, outstanding comment, had to do with the uh, alternatives analysis that was requested. And the reason for the alternatives analysis was um, because they are discharging into a zone A, which is the water, um, the drinking water supply, public water supply, and they're infiltrating, which is their discharge. So they're not discharging into a open water body, but they are infiltrating into the ground, which is part of the water supply because it's part of the aquifer. Um, we, there was numerous conversations going back and forth with DAP regarding if they were allowed to, because it is a development project, um, they are allowed to continue to, to discharge into the zone A. They are improving existing conditions with the design that they are proposing. We ask them to um, contain any runoff that may have a spill if some spill were to happen in that parking lot, we would like to have that surface, that stormwater contained immediately. And there is, um, on the plan, the applicant can show you exactly how next to the bioretention area, they are able to contain it into a sand filter that is, um, has impermeable liner associated with it. So, so 
ionized spill can be captured and prevented from discharging and immediately cleaned up if it were to actually have a spill. So that was the goal. And the alternative analysis was basically to show that the planning board, as well as the conservation commission, can include in your findings um, that this project is within zone A. They are discharging into zone A, but according to EP's regulations and the various options that they have, you have tried, have like have looked at different things, whether even leaving it alone as it stands, using permeable pavement, what that means, and so that you can be able to say, okay, this applicant did this, did these various choices and preferred options. This is uh, how well that they were able to get this done. In the event you have another applicant in the zone A coming along with the same. So they did provide an alternative analysis. Of course, they were satisfied with that. So the planning board, again, of course, um, may want to read it and review it and make sure that you're in agreement with it as well. And the third option was a comment that came up during our July 9th hearing. Um, I tried to, in the July 27th letter, list some of the comments that I had taken down during that um, hearing, and maybe I didn't hit them all, but I, I hit a number of them so that the applicant could respond and that they were in writing. Um, this one had to do with um, those two rooms that are in the barn that you were just discussing earlier, that, and then that they were not labeled as anything, they're just two rooms, and they may be for storage or for administration office, and I guess in our opinion, you might want to condition that if you do not want those rooms to become potential bedrooms, um, you may want to have a condition of such in your final decision. So our objective was to review the zoning bylaws and the stormwater management, but it is, we still defer to the planning board to make sure you are satisfied with the plan as it's presented. Thank you. Um, Steve, do you have any comment? Um, no, I think if we're going to go through the architectural plan, I, I do have some questions about the parking plan All right. and the lane, but um, we can do that with uh, the architect. All right, Ben, do you have anything? On what we've discussed so far? Yeah. Not, not particularly. I guess the only thing just to, just to confirm, because it was, for me, it was like the biggest elephant in the room last time is just that the correspondence that we've had with ZBA and also that Jeff brought up to start. I just want to, out of abundance of caution, make sure that my understanding is correct, which is that the use of permeable pavement um, was not factored into the Zoning Board of Appeals decision and that the percent, the 42.3 percent impervious, which they were going to allow as a reduction did not include permeable pavement. So that was like excluded from their their the square footage and the calculations of impervious. Yeah, at the uh, at the hearing, so I actually went back and uh, after our discussion on July 9th and went back and looked at uh, the entire videotape of it, there was actually a question from the building inspector directly to Paul as to whether we were proposing permeable pavement. The answer was in the negative, um, and that was pretty much the end of it. it. It wasn't factored into the decision of the zoning board such that there was a condition of approval that said you cannot use permeable pavement. And so we're perfectly, since we're not proposing it, we're perfectly happy with the condition if you you all wanted to propose that that's perfectly acceptable yeah yeah no mine wasn't so much about the use or non-use of it it was more of how the potential impermeable area was Affected. factored into the, the actual calculation of the impervious surface of right. for the site because that's what the whole section six planning was about i believe so yeah so, uh, Paul, you can answer that. I believe the answer, I believe the answer wasn't factored because there is none proposed. But go ahead. 
Is your concern that we are using permeable pavement? No, the concern is the concern is whether the zoning board's decision was predicated on calculations for permeable pavement that were yeah, considered yeah. to be permeable. Right. That's yeah. In the end, so. I don't so. They, they the weren't. Zoning board, they weren't. The answer was no. Right. That's correct. That's right. Yeah. All right. Um, the, there are some questions as Janet had brought up, and basically, if you the architect is with us this evening, okay. Um, the question really is about the barn and the parking in the barn, and these are workshops, correct? Am I to understand that correctly? The workshops yeah. for a carpenter or an electrician or whatever. And my question would be, if you have cars parked in there, how are they going to work? I mean... If, uh, on page three of the architectural plan, I think that shows what they propose. Uh, if you're writing, it looks like a car park. Yes, it, like does. it does. Opposed to a shop. Yes, it does. It so, does. So let me, do you mind if I just set this up uh, from the standpoint of the way the zoning bylaw works on this because there's some strange uh, issue there is section 760 of the zoning bylaw deals with parking and the way that um, when we when we design these projects we we take the use of the of the proposed property and then we match it to a, um, a chart within section 760 that tells us the total number of required parking spaces for that particular use. So the zoning bylaw allows this particular use that we're proposing in our zone. But when we go to section 760 and look at the parking chart, it's silent as to this use. So the parking chart doesn't ascribe any particular required parking for this use and I don't know why that is I don't know if it's because it's obvious that it's likely to be indoor parking or not but uh, it does not do that now when we designed this project we said well what what is what is the you know do we have any similar uses in this zoning district that we can look to and I believe on um, Ford Place, there was a similar project a few years back. So we used the same concept that we used then, um, which is that we think that it's reasonable to conclude that each one of those garage bays would only require one parking space. Um, and so nonetheless, in an abundance of caution, so we have 12 bedrooms and we require 12 parking spaces. And then we have three, uh, three workshop stations um, and we were proposing seven additional spaces for the three workstations. So we're, we're showing 19 spaces on our plan and our extrapolation is that we are, we only should be required 15. So we're showing these spaces within the garage bay as all being kind of crunched in uh, to Janet's point. But in, in reality, um, it's just showing that we have the ability for these extra spaces, but we don't believe that they're required. Um, now, in the opinion of the planning board, there are two sections within your zoning bylaw that allows the planning board to make exceptions to parking requirements. One area is in section seven, uh, 760, which allows the planning board to reduce, um, reduce it, my calculation was to nine, and that talked about the residential aspect and then with respect to the mixed use, section 560.6 says um, 
that the planning board may in, uh, may reduce the number of required parking spaces. So there's two areas that kind of allow it, but we think that we've kind of over-engineered this for parking in any event. Okay, Karen? All right, I'm going to disagree. Okay. Um, the use of shops and parking on 13 Ford Place was one space per 600 square feet. It was done according to the warehouse calculation. So one space per 600 square feet amounts to seven point something spaces and then you have 300 feet of office and 688 square feet of unfinished space unaccounted for as far as parking goes mm -hmm. residential it's in the village business overlay district you can make them go down to 1.5 spaces per unit so the board has to determine how much parking they really need here, and there are provisions to waive it. However, are there employees? How do they work? I mean, these are questions I'm not sure that have been answered to the board. I agree. Um, and I would say, I would say, you know, this when you do the math on just the spaces here, that would suggest you need at least six parking spaces. Right, if you do it one per 600 square feet, right? Yeah, I would be more worried about whether anybody's going to actually park a vehicle inside these spaces or not. I would too. And where outside the spaces are they going to park? There's no place to park. There's no park. There aren't any parking spaces outside. No. Right? So. There's four, which would be for the tenants. Right. Well, yeah. yeah, but this is, these aren't the tenants, right? These are the, the worker these are the bees. Grass. Right. So, and that's something. Well, have a truck and might be two guys, right? So, I, I would say at a minimum, they got to have two parking spaces per, per one of these shops, right? And you, I don't see how they could park them inside, Steve. How can you work around a truck? The whole point is Actually, the garages. The, the problem is, is that if we accept this as this is the parking, then they have to park inside. They cannot. There aren't any parking spaces outside this thing. But then how can you say that it's a shop for a tradesman or a carpenter or an electrician? Is it this just where there's... It's a small shop, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is this just a place to store your vehicle and your stuff? You're not going to actually do any work there? The truth of the matter, that's the most interest I've had, storage. Super storage. Wonderful. Okay, Karen, anything else? Well, so is, is the board deciding that that's sufficient? Because no. I, I need to know that no. it, to write a draft decision. I no, need it's to not know sufficient. which way you're, you're going to go. Nope, it's not sufficient. So, what, so since we don't have a chart, can you tell me what the board believes would be sufficient? Mindful of the fact that you have the ability to make waivers and well, so forth. Hold the waivers in advance. Steve? Yeah, I, to me, I would say two two spaces per shop, right? Okay. Yep. Uh, I, I don't see it being just one space. Um, and, you know, we have sort of operating experience with these kinds of shops and other places, right, up around, um, over by uh, Untold Brewing, right? And what you see a lot of is our trucks are sort of parked outside, not inside, right? You're talking about Hallen's property. Yeah. Yeah. So That's exactly what we don't want to do. Okay. Our intention is not to have the trucks parked outside. All right. Um, I mean, if they, if they, you know, the, the guy who's renting this as a, you know, a, a electrical electrician or a carpenter or whatever wants to store material and work in this space, as long as he's comfortable with his his vehicle inside his space while he's doing it. Uh, you know, I can't imagine like a carpenter doing woodwork is going to want to have his, his vehicle covered in sawdust here or anything. But, um, and, and so that just begs the question what would they end up doing, right? Right. I think they'd end up parking outside this building. And where are the parking spaces? Speculation and supposition. 
Excuse me? That's speculation and supposition. You know, we've shown the parking spaces inside the building. All right. Um, shall we, can we? I think we need to move on. We, we need to move on. We have a lot of issues we that we need to. We have a lot of issues to cover. All right, keep going, Karen. Um, so I sent the board an email last uh, Friday. I outlined a number of issues that I read back from the last meeting minutes. And as I've been trying to write a draft decision, I have come across issues that I need input on. Um, first one is the board seeking any type of mitigation. I can just go all down the list and then you can pick and choose what you want to talk about. Um, the alternatives analysis, is it acceptable? I got a comment late this afternoon and um, we don't think it's acceptable for the board, for the alternatives analysis to say the planning board knows the reasons. We want the reasons spelled out in the alternatives analysis. No legal documents have been submitted. Normally you ask for first draft of a condo association, etc., which brings up the whole issue of how is this going to be. Uh, my understanding based on emails is the residential building is ownership. This uh, barn building is rental. So it'll be under a condominium association with both ownership and rental. That's your assumption. That's based on emails that have gone back and forth to your team. If that's right. not correct, we need to know that right now. That's correct. Okay. Yes, yeah, so the, the rental will be owned by one individual? Yes. Will be a member of the condo association? Yes. All right, so the, um, we can condition signs in the shops. That's not a problem. The O&M plan has been provided as a standalone document, as well as the long-term pollution plan. I received comments late this afternoon on the O&M plan, and it needs a lot of work. The board <coughs> has to decide if they want to restrict salt for de-icing and fertilizers, um, because that's not, uh, that's kind of vague. If they, there's conditions in the O&M plan about that. Landscaping. Trees must be two and a half inch caliper minimum. The proposed beach is very close to the 24 inch pipe. The line of arbor body to the rear for screening is four to six feet tall. Is the board happy with that? Mixed shrub border is all deciduous. I would recommend some evergreen. The plan is labeled not for construction and not stamped. Um, we want it stamped. Um, these changes could be done as conditions, um, as, as screening is required adjacent to residential zones. Your impervious surface is now 42.3%. Um, there is stormwater management, which is a um, which is a benefit. The bike rack is shown in the middle of the grass area. We just talked about parking. Um, conservation has not heard the project. The resource areas have not been verified by them. Um, I think I found in the notes and everything that waste disposal is all internal to the units. Site distance. I can't make any findings if there's adequate site distance if I have no information on that. Surety. Surety is going to be a condition that's going to be required um, as you've done on other projects of this sort. Um, glazing and design uh, review recommendations. The glazing for one building is 18%, one is at 19%. The requirements call for 50% on the first floor, 30% on the second floor. This is something you have waived before, but are you, you have to decide if you're okay with that. Um, the design review committee recommended one of the windows to change on the uh, side facing Old Country Way on the residential building. Um, I don't see any change in the plans yet. Um, and site lighting. Those are the issues that I've come across as I am trying to put together the draft decision that I think need board input. Yes. 
which you will get. All right. Um, Can I speak to the window? Yes. Okay. So during the design... Would you just identify yourself again? Yes, yeah, sorry. I'm Kelly Conlon. I'm um, here with Jill Dubar Architects. Um, and the design um, review board had made suggestions to, to do something to that side of the building. The window was a suggestion. We felt that it was, they, they really liked the, the facade of the barn and the um, awnings of the barn. And um, we couldn't do anything that was overhanging too much because it was going to deal with um, the lot coverage. And so what we did instead was we actually flared the shingles around the entire building and enclosed the back decks. We felt like it added something. When the discussion was that um, it, the building felt really clean, and so we were trying to add something without it being, we felt that a bay window was not appropriate for somewhere else on the site. And so that's, that's the decision we made, and we felt like it was a great decision to be able to add a little bit of something to the building without it being something that's kind of stuck onto it. Okay. And that's... What did, um, what did Al think about that? Al's what? <laughs> he's, he's left the meeting, Steve. He had a he had a conflict. But they show you show this on the most recent September eighth plan that we have. Yes, that's on here. On the, it's, it's a little hard to see in the rendering, but you can see it in the elevations on page um, A H two hundred and two hundred and one. I bubbled it. It's just a bit of a flare. You know, it's, it's when you see the shingles flare out, and it. It wraps the back decks, which I think is a, a much before the decks just kind of look tacked on, so it just ties the building together nicely all the way around. Okay. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, could you explain what the kitchen window change was proposed? They, they, wanted, they mentioned potentially doing some kind of bay window or something more pronounced on that elevation. We still see that elevation as a side elevation. It's not really supposed to be the front elevation, which is part of the reason why we decided to make this adjustment. We did add one window, as you can see, that's bubbled. Um, it was sort of a, a more, the facade was a little bit more shingle before. So we did add a window to help with that as well. Okay. All right. On the gable end side. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, we have a lot of things that we have to go through here. I'll open it up to further comments from the board. But we also need to open it up to the public. Uh, I just want to know we don't have any public. Okay. Steve. So we're, we're holding off on the lighting strategies. And really you're going to share that with us next time or whatever. Yes, yes we have yes. somebody that we're going to bring in that will have, we'll have a plan that has okay. the, light, the lights on it. Yes. All right. That's it. All right, how does the board feel about mitigation in terms of offering up something? Karen? Um, I think it's up to the board. You've required mitigation on a lot of projects. So, I mean, somebody, it's been raised in some of your other public hearings now. So, that's why I'm raising it to the board tonight. Okay. What would the board be interested in seeing mitigation of? We're, what we're really trying to do here is to set up a sidewalk fund. We want to, con to extend the sidewalk from Huey Row down into Greenbush. Yeah, but you can't do it on this property because of the amount of impervious area. No, 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 you, no, no. Oh, okay. off-site. No. Off-site. Okay. Mm. So what we're looking for and we're asking different developers with their projects to something for the public good. What is the benefit that, besides building all of this, that benefits Greenbush? <coughs> so, I think that's a nice, nice ask for the public good. Um, I just want to clarify, though. Didn't this town vote to approve the appropriation of CPC money for sidewalks in Greenbush? It was adjudicated and it can't be done with CPC funds after a lawsuit in Norwell. That was, that was with respect to Norwell though, right? But it... And this was approved to be a, a, a six-foot-wide multi-use trail. 
which does not offend the town of Norwell, right? You have to understand, Jeff, that because of this, because of what happened in Norwell, Situate is not going to use any further CPC money to push that trail, sidewalk, whatever you want, down to Greenbush. The engineering is done, there, it, it's up to date and so on. Move a few telephone poles. But we can't use CPC money for it. We can't. So what we're trying to do is come up with a fund to mitigate, add to, and, and get the sidewalk. So it's just one thought. If you can come up with something better, that's fine. Okay. I, I just I needed to understand that because I've been personally impacted by the sidewalk. I know with so the, with the um the issue the telephone pole right in the middle of it. I so understand. Now I understand. They have applied for grants um, for other sources, so they are looking actively seeking to look money for money because that segment of sidewalk is important for bringing people into Greenbush safely safely and making Greenbush a vibrant area which is what all the zoning anticipated mm. okay so that's thought that's a thought all right um, there doesn't seem to be anybody on the line it is eight o'clock and we have some interviews that we have to do we have to continue this public hearing so. I think we need to hone in on the fact that it's really because it's too much like for making this project. Um, but we have. Steve? So we can make some progress here. Um, do we have. So if it's two parking spaces. Uh, Karen has a fairly lengthy list of things. Yeah, um, that means that we're only 18. Are they comfortable to you know kind of next steps on these things? Well, I think they need to have a copy of your comments that you gave to, to Karen this afternoon and then they can respond to them um, I'd like to you know we'd all like to see them as well so I mean we have some work to do here and yes um, if I may I actually just thought of one thing that since you yes. guys have the art representative from the architecture team here it might make sense to ask so yes so, ask because um, it was something that I brought up in the initial meeting which is that in the elevation drawings it shows a, a third floor but in the floor plan, really uh, yeah, speak into the mic or something. I think it's loud. Okay. Speak loud. Um, yeah. Sorry, it's an architectural question, Steve. Um, it has to do with I, I asked this at the first at the opening hearing, but in the elevations it shows a third floor in the residential building, but in the floor plan set there's no floor plans for a third floor. So I just wanted to comment on what that third floor is. We did respond to it at one point from one of the emails back and forth. It's just storage, it would just be like a pull down attic kind of thing. It doesn't it's not meant to be living space at all. Okay. Just say storage. It's all the middle units would be totally dark and the end units have one window just for the facades that they're not meant to be there's no the, the previous design the initial design had had three um three living floors but we felt like the size of the units didn't go out for three three floors so they will not be having space right. going along that same line since these units are condos then what is to prevent someone who purchases the second floor to then dormer above them well, I don't know if that's something that like mm -hmm. can be with them. Condo Association. Yeah. Approval on that. Yeah, yeah they need okay. condo association. All right, fine. They Just wouldn't have sewer capacity for that's it. That's right, they would yeah. not. That's okay. not the intention. Okay, fine. Thank you. Had to throw that out. So, just so I, I, I understand you, you would like to continue the hearing. Um, on the issue of parking, because that appears to me to be a bit of a threshold issue. Um, I just want to clarify the expectation is is that you're requiring two parking spaces for each of the three units of commercial space um, and right now on the plans that are before you we're showing seven total parking spaces between the three of them so is is the expectation that we would revise our parking 
such that there would be two for each unit. Is that it? That would be my recommendation. Uh, okay. I don't know what the rest of the board thinks. And I think your point about um, them having to park inside those buildings, that has to be enforced because there aren't any parking spaces outside the building. Understood. In, unless, unless the board decided that it is my recommendation, I, I guess we should hear from the rest of the board. Uh, the, the only point I would make to that, Steve, is outside spaces would be able to be utilized in the event that the board decided to avail itself of the zoning provision that allows it to reduce the number of parking spaces for two bedroom units in this zoning district from two to one and a half per. Right? That's is that what I thought I heard Karen say? That's a, that's you can do that in the village business overlay district. I would assume you would only do that for the rental units, not the ones not the residential building because you've already got you've got a driveway and an inside garage for each one of them. So that would mean yeah, that would, parking space. I, I think I would leave that the way it is. Right. Okay. Yeah. Try to figure out a way with that barn to have some outside parking besides the other four spaces that you have to the right of the barn because it seems to me those would be for the um, tenants the three tenants that you have in that building yeah it's I think so, that I think the challenge might be I mean, we'll, we'll look into that I think the challenge might be the amount of impervious area um, yeah I, think, I don't think there's I think I don't think there's available to do that. I think that's the problem there. So if we did two spots per bay, and then if we were allowed to do one and a half per upper unit, then it could be down to nine. So then we'd have the four outside and only five inside. Is that? No. 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 What we're aiming at here is really not to have any inside, no parking inside the garages. No, you, you can have no. to have parking inside. Parking. Yeah. All right. What you're trying to do is you're trying to allow outdoor space. The two rental units have to have outside. I parking. understand that, Karen. I do. And it's three spaces between the two units. But I don't. I can't wrap my head around the fact that this is going to be a contractor's. Is this strictly? Do we condition this that it's nothing but storage and you can't have a a workroom there? But if you have two per cars parked. And then the other half of it is workspace. That's a lot of, I mean, it's, they're, they're very big bays. I mean, we can, I can populate this with some, something to show more, I don't know if it's equipment or something so you can see. It's actually, they're very large bays. The bay that has four parking in it, and it, four cars parked in it right now is, that's chock full. Clearly nobody could work around that. But if we only had two per bay, then we could definitely have, there's a lot of space for somebody to work. Yeah. And I you know, I, I guess I would say is as long as you're comfortable with that as a commercial offering to somebody that they have to park inside and, you know, they only can park two vehicles then, and it has to be inside, then that's really an uh, economic decision on your part as to whether you can rent those or not. Right. Okay. So, so you want to do two spaces per shop with no outside parking for the shops. Yeah, well, I don't see any, unless you can tell me differently, I don't see where there could be outside parking so for the shop. One of the outside spots could be if we go down to the one and a half car. It just, right. it's going to get ugly. Yes, writing this, I mean, writing this decision is going to get ugly. Well, and uh, the other thing but is, what we if can some, do that. you have two people, two vehicles parked in, in one of these shops? And then you have the, the two tenants upstairs. You've got maybe two vacant parking spots. And what happens if people come to visit that they want to utilize, talk to, whatever? Where are they going to park? Where are they going to go in a two-bedroom unit? You know. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about people who want to come and see the contractor. Oh. Uh. Well, that's a, I mean, that's assuming that, you know, I, I'm married to a tiling contractor and he would just park his car in there and nobody would come see him. He would be using it as just a spot to keep his stuff and keep his truck and do whatever. You know, I, I don't think it necessarily means that people would be coming 
the shop. To the shop. Well, right. I, I, I just I just want to just close it out and just just say we're in a water Res resource I area. I understand that. And what we're trying to do, I think, what would probably be in the community's best interest would be to 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 have a site that that doesn't that doesn't have a big parking area on it um, and so we'll, we'll look in we'll look into the issue but I just want the board to hopefully just kind of keep that in their mind that that's that's the challenge like sometimes sometimes your regulations n to no fault of your own require oversized basins and over over parking designs um, that are counterproductive to the some people's opinions about the what this community should look like so in this particular circumstance and you know we're pretty maxed out as Steve pointed out on the site as far as what we can do with impervious area and the goal is to actually use the site with as least impervious area as possible and we're proposing something that has less impervious area than and treatment into the earth than what is there now which is more impervious area and no treatment in the earth so just kind of pointing those kind of that delicate dance out to the board it just was a little bit over the top to see four vehicles in that one bay understood so and I we could eliminate one vehicle because we've over designed we have 19 parking spaces and we would only need and 18. Other thing we've seen you now you're putting solar panels on the roof of this as well uh, been on there since the start. has not this is what what i heard her say no, it has. oh it has i'm yes. sorry yes. i'm sorry okay. all right you don't notice test. them right away because it's not on the cover sheet it's on the it's on the well, they are sheet. on the cover sheet they're just black on black so you don't see them as well but you see them on the elevation but don't, but don't you want that yes, to reduce yes, the yes, amount of fine. community impact yeah we'll okay those tests with solar panels which we can't have yeah. all right we need to to move on here um we have uh, scheduled you, Karen, for November 12th at 7 o'clock. Okay. Is there anything we can work on in the meantime? Yeah, the I, I have my list and I have a plan. We'll take care of it. 7 p.m.? Yeah, 7 p.m. All right. I'll sign whatever you need me to sign. I move to accept the applicant's request to continue the yeah. public hearing for the mixed use special permit in the village business overlay district for the property located at 14 country way until November 12, 2020 at 7 p.m. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Ms. Burbine. Aye. Ms. Warnstein. Aye. Ms. Lambert. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. Aye. Ms. Lewis. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good night. Good night, Janet. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you for your time. <laughs>
I think we should go by your agenda. Yeah, you can. Okay, the first one is, is Paulette O'Donnell here? Oh, she is. Um, Sherry? Yes. Okay. You just need Patty. Oh, that's good. Okay. Right up front. Okay. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Good. Because another member is going to shut up away. Um, we're going to lose things. Yeah, no, we're not. We can't do that. <laughs> we already lost the internet several times. Oh, no. <laughs> we're not gonna... Okay, Patty's here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, Patty, you're going to go first. Yeah, Patty, you're going to go first. All right. Can you hear me? I think we're fine. Yeah. All that. It's fine. Okay. Hello. How's it going? It's going. <laughs> All right, we have a list of. Tell us about yourself, Paul. Okay, so Paul O'Connell, um, been a 20 year, almost 20 year resident. It'll be 19 tomorrow, uh, this weekend. Resident of Situate, I live in the Sand Hills. Um, I've got two kids, one's going to seventh grade, uh, sixth grade, one's going into ninth grade, both at Situate Public Schools. Um, I'm an architect. I started my own business here 10 years ago on the South Shore. I uh, work in the Bailey Building in downtown uh, Situate on Front Street, so I'm sort of here, day in and day out in the community and seeing what's going on. Um, and that's really what spurred me to be trying to be more involved um, with with the town on that side of things. Um, you know, both in I used to work in Boston, and now in my own business, I've been up in front of boards like this forever. And I know it's such a back and forth, and I'd love to be on that other side of things, sort of being able to make an impact. I know things have gone kind of crazy exponentially in the past ten years here, considering what I saw the first ten years I've lived here from now. And really, um, want to hope I can retain some of what I moved to Situate here for, and also continue the growth um, of the town and kind of keep that moving along in a way that we can all be happy with. Um, all right, we have a laundry list here. Sure. Just sort of go through them. What issues do you see the planning board facing in Situate? Well. It's interesting now with the whole COVID thing because I feel like some of these may change. Um, but seeing it from now, I just think of um, trying to make sure that there isn't just such an influx of sort of cookie cutter homes coming in and sort of taking over what's ha what you know beautiful vernacular we have going on in this town, and also trying to bring in some bigger some businesses, um, especially now. You know, I'm just for Reva's closing. You know, there's probably others to follow. Just trying to keep those small businesses both in downtown, North Situate. I heard someone bought the bank building, but what's going to happen with that? You know, really just trying to keep the commercial industry in here and growing rather than losing it. And maybe COVID's an opportunity for that, and maybe not in terms of, you know, people could be coming here from the city or trying to get away from other places, and our population growth could grow a little bit more, and maybe we could retain and attract some of that. But that's really for like what I find to be really important for this town is just trying to keep a balance and not make it so cookie cutter, but you know try to keep it part of this, keep it growing, and keep it and keep some more and bring some more businesses to town as well. All right, I'll open it up to questions from the board. We'll start with you, Steve. Do you have anything you'd like to ask? I'm, I'm sorry. I think you asked me a question, Ann, but I'm getting about half of what's coming through. It might be my. Okay. Rebecca? Might be my. No, I'm the same way, Steve, so. Okay. Um, and, and so I, I think this is Paulette. Is that right? Yes. 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 Yes, Steve. Okay. Okay. I'm just trying to make sure I didn't hear a lot of what the sort of the introduction was. Um, so, in terms of, um, I'd, I'd be interested in 
your take on the uh, challenges of the town's infrastructure, sewer, water, um, those kinds of sort of limited resources and how you would see balancing development against that? You know, sort of coming in and trying to learn things. A sewer is a huge issue, obviously, the brown water that we all have experienced throughout the town. Um, but trying to come up, you know, when we have developers coming in, maybe for the larger projects, if we could have a little sort of back and forth and have them sort of work within their own lots of land, potentially, and see what we can do to uh, make new, sorry. <laughs> We can make new infrastructure sort of self-sufficient rather than trying to use the resources already in town while trying to continue the improvements that we've been doing through town. I remember we uh, approved millions and millions of dollars to replace all this sewer and we're still having some of the same challenges that we had before. And I know that we've done the ice pigging and things like that. But if we could try to come up with some more creative solutions for what we've got going on, but any new infrastructure coming in, potentially have them either you know go to a fund or create themselves to be self-sufficient on their own lots of land mm -hmm. could help us build, you know, within the town without drawing on the resources that we have already sort of tapped out. Did you hear that, Steve? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Patty? Um, one of our biggest challenges, of course, is zoning. So do you understand zoning bylaws and how we make them and change them? Yes. Okay. That's our basis for everything. Yes. So, and, and it's convoluted. As you see, we adopted new village overlay, and it's, it's, it's a learning curve for everybody. Um, how do you feel about the zoning in North Central and Greenbush in particular, vis-a-vis -vis the new zoning bylaw? New zoning. I think, you know, I definitely think it's going to be an improvement, especially, um, you know, when you're driving through North Situate, you're just sort of seeing all those cars and the small little buildings. And if we can actually get it to feel more of a community bound, I think that's a great idea. I mean, I deal with zoning on a daily basis as an architect. I've run up against zoning boards here and in numerous towns. And I really think there is a benefit to them. And that's what's sort of the back and forth of the whole part of the town process and the architect or the builder or the developer back and forth. Um, I think that the green bush has really come along. I like the idea that we've had, um, especially for um, the uh, parks, you know, trying to connect everything through sort of a greenway, because I really think that would bring a lot more, you know, foot traffic to those areas, which is sadly lacking in both both ends of the world. So I think if you can get more people living in that area and also some more foot traffic in the paths and the greenway space to those spaces, I think those are really great um, zoning pieces to those that I, uh, but also moving, you know, I, I see the vision. I love like watching those little maps and you seeing sort of like existing and new and you can really see sort of how vibrant of a community those two spaces really could, those two places could be. Thank you. Rebecca? Oh, shoot. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. I'm looking behind um, myself. <laughs> I was just going to ask you if you had any questions for the planning board. Um, my biggest question, just sort of, you know, coming sort of the daily workings of how, you know, how you guys work together, um, I guess is more for me. You know, I think there's going to be a bit of a learning curve for me to sort of learn every little piece of everything, but I do have a good start, especially since I deal with the zoning code, you know, almost every day. Um, but just sort of how you guys work, you know, not in the public forums, but behind the scenes, so to speak. I guess that's one way to talk about it. And, um, and implementing community interests, because I know that you've had you know, that Situate 2040 and trying to bring you know, communities to you and how you try to draw that support um, for the community at large. Ben? Um, am I responding to the question or am I asking? <laughs> <laughs> One of, one of the things you mentioned was um, kind of balancing preservation of the character of the town that, you, that brought you here in the first place and that you admire, uh, uh, and along with like growth. So one of the things obviously you normally do is like planning in addition to permitting projects. So and part of the we do the way we do that is through the planning process and through zoning, which you're very familiar with. But um, I guess in your opinion, what would be some I guess zoning bylaw additions or changes? 
or long-term planning initiatives that you think would be should be a priority going forward in town? Um, well, let's see. <laughs> Back as I was expecting the answer, and I got a question. Could you repeat the question so I could what what zoning bylaws would I want to change or? Um. So Sorry. what what would be um, I guess to preserve the character of the town to preserve the character and allow for growth. What might be some? Okay. Um, I know there's one thing that Situate doesn't really have is like a historic preservation sort of community that's as strong as some other communities around on the South Shore. And I think maybe sort of not necessarily having a board per se, but maybe implementing a little bit more of the historical character piece that people have to retain. So if you were to buy an old historic home, you couldn't just knock it down and build whatever you want. Um, but, you know, I think that's a really important piece just to keep the character, you know, of the homes and businesses um, a little bit like they were. I mean, some, some towns go overboard, but other towns really have no oversight. And I think that's something that we could really work on to try to answer that exact question and sort of retain a little bit of what we got, but continue growth. Because I think there's a way to work within that together. All right. Um, the only constant we have is change it's the only constant we have and we have to make it work and it's one of those things people don't like change nope they really don't and somehow I believe in, in involving as many people as possible in doing all of this Ben's in, working on the new master plan we have a number of different things that are coming along so um, if just to throw this out if you are if you are not selected would you be interested in applying for another committee in other words getting continue to get involved yes i've really been trying to get more involved you know like i said my kids are finally getting to that age where i can okay. dedicate some time outside of the house which is great um you know so that was sort of why i've started this year i did the desire review, review committee it's why at this point in time I'm trying to get more active in the town and trying to be a part of something because I have the time and um, I've definitely had the passion to do it throughout the years and I think this is the time where I can get there and I think this is a really important time because like I said I think the first 10 years I've lived here there really wasn't that much going on and in the past 10 years it's been exponentially busy which is good and you know like I said change is good but uh, you know, so I think now is like a really important time for me to become more involved on that side of things. Or well, I hope you will continue. Great. Thank you. Involved. Okay. Thank you so much for your Thank time. Thank you all. I appreciate it. All right. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Who's next? Um, yeah. I know I cleaned everything. No, it's good. I'm all Lars is next. Just going to wipe down. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Who's coming next? Lars. Lars. Home quest. So just make sure you're speaking loud so that the phone the phone is what's picking everyone's voices up. What? Yeah. I know, I don't know who's it's someone's phone off uh, not here. Maybe it's raining though. <laughs> I wish it would rain. Okay. I can turn it, maybe if I turn it down a little bit, but I don't know if they'll be able to hear us. Okay. okay. Next. Next. I wiped down all the seats. They're a little sticky. Hello. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> okay, introduce yourself, um, where you live. Um, I can hear who it is. Who, who, who is? Uh, Lars Homequest is here. Lars, okay. okay? Can I take my mask off Absolutely. here? Absolutely, okay. yes. Wonderful. Yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Lars Homequist. I'm a three year resident of uh, Situate. And uh, my. Uh, between my own ambitions and my and my wife's uh, prodding, uh, I uh, want to get more involved in in the town. Uh, love this town, and uh, so when I saw the opportunity to get involved with the uh, planning board, uh, I jumped on the opportunity and applied. So, what do you think you could bring to the planning board? 
Um, well, I've had a very uh, um, successful business career. Um, I'm quite comfortable in a lot of different ver environments uh, with a lot of different rules. So I've worked in a number of different states and countries, uh, and that gives me a, a, a perspective about process, about detail, about getting things done. And I think uh, that might uh, suit this, this particular role. I'll open it up to questions from the board. We'll start with you, Rebecca. I guess I can see here. Okay. Um, ha have you been or to any of the planning board meetings that we've had here? Uh, no, but I, I guess all you can do now is watch. <laughs> yes, I have watched them, but I have not been to any. Uh, so yes, on the uh, YouTube channel. They're exciting, aren't they? <laughs> um, I will admit that I did fast forward a few times. I don't blame you. Um, I would too. So, um, but yes, no, no, I'm aware of, uh, of the proceedings and, and uh, roughly the, the order of business and how it transpires. Steve? Um, well, being a newcomer to situate, what do you see are the uh, sort of biggest challenges for the long-term you know, development and, and sustainability of the town of Situate um, as it is. What, what sort of impressed you in the, in the last three years? I think two things impressed me. Um, number one, I actually was really impressed with uh, citizen involvement, and I have not personally been involved in um, local governance in Massachusetts before, and I have to say it's really refreshing having uh, citizen involvement in town meetings and then I also got involved a little bit with volunteering and my wife and I uh, take care of a uh, an adopt a lot downtown uh, so we got to meet the uh, the committee that's uh, responsible for beautification through that process and so I just got a very good feeling that there was good town participation having said that in answer to your question uh, what uh, is clear is that uh, it's an old town and consequently there's old infrastructure and there's a lot to be done. There were things that weren't taken care of over the years or that simply broke down over the period of time. And so there's some big issues facing the town that have required uh, bond issues to, uh, to fund. So for instance, the senior center, which was a long time coming and was approved at a town meeting last year. Um, so things along those, uh, along those lines made me realize that A, a lot needs to be done, but there does seem to be a good level of citizen involvement and I thought that was uh, attractive. Um, Patty? Um, so we deal a lot with trying to rationalize and protect our watershed, which is a big issue here. So uh, we have a project that comes before us and meets all the bylines and fits in all the little nooks and crannies. But as a whole, elementary, we feel that we cannot support that. How, do you, how would you rationalize not supporting what fit into our bylaw? Does that make sense? <laughs> um, I, I think the whole point of a planning board is to, uh, number one, adjudicate the zoning bylaws as they're written. However, it is also to um, uh, uphold uh, the idea of what Situate wants to be. The master planning process is part of that. Um, the uh, village district uh, work and visioning uh, as part of that, even this coastal visioning process, that's all part of that. And I think uh, the reason you have a board is that you uh, pass some judgment. And uh, judgment sometimes requires that uh, you uh, look at things for on their, uh, based on their merits. Not always exactly the way it's written in the zoning bylaws or uh, potentially uh, suggest bylaw revisions like the ones that we were uh, proposing now uh, coming up in uh, the November town meeting. Um, what, fr from a planning perspective, uh, I guess, what do you foresee as being a major issue for our town in the future? And also, and feel free to offend us if you want, <laughs> what do you see as, what do you think we're doing wrong yeah. right now? Um, uh, let me start with what I think uh, we collectively are doing right. 
I, I think uh, the rezoning in the village districts is a really, really good idea and enforcing um, some standards around what makes a livable village. I think that's super important. Um, so I think that's, that's absolutely a step in the right direction. Um, I wonder if, on the other hand, I wonder if um, we are taking full advantage of all of the resources available for watershed protection, coastal protection, these sorts of things. Um, are we tapping into all of the right sources there? I don't know. I'm really not in a position to know, but that's an open question to me. Knowing that, that's a, a, a particular concern. The source of our drinking water is a big concern, obviously. Um, uh, the protection of our coastline is, is a big concern, and they're overlapping jurisdictions. So uh, it's, it's complicated how those things are, are, are decided and managed. So I, I wonder if we've optimized that yet. Thank you. All right. Um, do you have any questions for us? Uh, I do. Um, as you were looking at this position, I'm sure you had some expectations uh, as to what the alternate uh, board member uh, would add to um, to this body. So perhaps what are you know some of those um, uh, things that you were thinking of that would enhance uh, the functioning of the board? Well, the alternate is actually an important position in that we need that sixth person if somebody doesn't make it, especially if we have a special permit, which is a super majority. It's um, the alternate speaks, the alternate can give their opinion, add whatever, but if the full complement is here, unfortunately the alternate cannot vote. But whatever thoughts they have taken on, you know, worth mentioning. You know, it's just the alternate. Uh, I would, what? I would, the, the input from an alternate board member is just an import, as important as the input from a board member. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. At the end of the day, it's about the, the process um, to get to a final vote that we can all support and you know having having six people uh, evaluating that and providing input to that uh, is is just a six better than having five people do that and so I, I think our expectation from an alternate board member and, and both um, Ben and uh, well I have been and Ben has and yeah. Yeah. Uh, Regina has, has been a board, an alternate. Um, I have. We all have. We would oh. expect full participation. <laughs> that, I think that's really um, uh, sort of the the underlying uh, job of an alternate board member is to act just as any other board member would. Right. And right. the other thing too is it's an opportunity to learn the process because it is a process. And it, it takes a while to get your feet wet. And the only stupid question is the one you never asked. Yeah. So. In fact, I was going to ask that, uh, given that it's uh, you know brand new, I imagine there, it's, it's like jumping off into the deep end of the swimming pool. Yes. Um, there's a lot to learn. I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the zoning bylaws. There's much to learn. Uh, I fully acknowledge that. So. Um, how has that process gone before? Is there, um, you know, sort of a suggested learning path or something uh, that you would suggest for the successful candidate to do? Well, to be if prepared. <laughs> to be prepared, we will deal with that when we have our successful candidate. And you know, th there's just this is the Bible. This is, you know, our um, zoning bylaws. We have a zoning um, bylaw review committee. This selectmen, obviously, conservation, all interplay. So, you know, there's a lot going on. And it is, as I said, a learning curve. But input is necessary. And hopefully, what we like is, even though you might not be able to vote, be here. You know, that's the point, to be here. Yep. It's necessary. 
So. Yeah, and, and I anticipate that you know that would require all the preparation for the particular uh, applications that are before right. the board. You do and, your I mean, homework. You do the whole, yes. You have to do your yeah. homework. Okay. okay. So let me ask you this. If for some reason you were not selected, are you interested in possibly, hopefully, trying to apply for another committee? In other words, I, I, get I would be certainly. I mean, I read the Mariner, and I uh, am aware that uh, there's a, a fair amount of uh, uh, positions available. Yes. Um, this appealed to me for the reasons I stated in my letter of interest, but uh, you know, of course, I'm interested. Um, it would be hypocritical to say uh, I'm interested in uh, working with the local community and then, you know, ignore disappear. it. If, right. Right. So. so don't disappear if <laughs> if this doesn't work. Okay. So. So, well, I thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. I hope that I have the opportunity to work with you uh, closely in the coming days and weeks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know where to look. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Right. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Robert McLean is the. Yeah. You gotta wait for. Yeah. Oh, you're gonna I'm going to give you a break. Thanks. We're Yes, ma'am. Oh, wow. Okay. So, give us your who you are, what you're doing, and why you want to be here. Uh, so, I grew up in Lexington. Name, you know, an address. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Bob McLean. I live at 155 Chief Justice Cushing Highway. And anything else for admin and for No, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I grew up in Lexington. I uh, went to Lexington High School. Um, uh, went to West Point, graduated in 2002, and served on active duty from 2002 to 2008, uh, with, uh, initially with the 173rd Airborne out of Italy to do the Iraq invasion, and then um, I deployed to Iraq two more times in Afghanistan once with uh, the Army's Ranger Regiment. Um, after that, Leaving active duty, I took a position as an engineer with a heavy um, heavy equipment, uh, piping, electrical equipment uh, for oil and gas companies. And I worked, lived in Bahrain, but worked mostly in Saudi Arabia, um, other places in the Middle East, and also Eastern Europe. Uh, in Turkey, so straddling that. Uh, after that, I came uh, a couple of years of that, had enough with uh, living in the Middle East and wanted to move closer to home, and I actually moved over to work in finance. And I worked in finance for about seven years. Um, started to grow tired of working in finance, uh, so took a job actually um, repairing boats for Boston Harbor Cruises. And after doing that for a while, I um, took a job as a hydraulic engineer for FEMA. So now I actually make the FEMA flood maps that everyone loves. Wow. <laughs> yep. Most, I didn't ever want to put that out there, but yes, that's my job. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So why do you want to be on the planning board? Uh, so my wife and I, uh, we are kind of newcomers in this town. Uh, we wanted to move down here uh, because we liked what the town had to offer. Um, and we wanted to start and raise our family here. Uh, and that ties into why I'm interested in working with the town uh, to help develop it and because I'm interested in 
giving my family uh, the best possible town to grow up in. Okay. Um, Steve, questions? Uh, yeah, well, um, I, I guess I will ask you the same question I asked previously, and that is, what do you see are the sort of greatest, in your short time here, are the biggest challenges or the biggest needs in town with respect to planning your people? And what do you see as, you know, sort of the biggest uh, strength of the town? Uh, so starting out with um, the biggest needs uh, for planning, I think that there are there are some uh, certain issues uh, specifically related to water and sewer uh, and other utilities of uh, the electrical grid that do need improvement. But I think the challenge with that is moving from uh, the planning and um, the research phase of it to uh, developing a plan and executing on the plan and taking care of the or taking advantage of uh, the structures and um, facilities that we actually already have to at the base level um, generate more tax revenue to do more things with the town that we'd want to do more projects for town improvement, uh, schools improvement, etc. So, <clears throat> I think the the actual physical challenges are uh, utility issues, and um, but we're getting over the hump from planning and studying to execution is, I think, uh, the biggest challenge. Uh, as far as the strengths go, um, Situate does, has, a, has a great uh, small town community feel to it. Uh, it's very welcoming. Uh, but beyond that, the reason why my wife and I were so into Situate is that there is a lot of area that is, um, I would say, ready and ripe for for growth. Uh, it's not so much we need to take undeveloped land and add new growth, but use what's actually existing to grow wisely uh, and improve the town long term. Okay. Thank you. Rebecca? I have to, if I could ask just a follow up question, I just have to ask it that you're doing the theme of flood maps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't. I, was, I wasn't there when <laughs> the last time you guys went through it. That's my boss, actually. Now what? It's his boss. My boss is uh, who was here in. I think it was 2014 or yeah, 15. Okay. For so, our newest re rendition. Yes, I, I've read about the yeah. the issues. So keep on working on them. Okay. All right, Steve. You all set? Sure. Okay. Uh, Rebecca? Um, I just was wondering how you felt. It sounds like you've had a positive attitude about the amount of growth that has gone on in Situate recently. And what, what is your opinion on that? Uh, I do have a positive um, view of it. And just seeing what's been going on, it, it I think that it's been done smartly. I, I also think that um, given the uh, kind of the upheaval that we've seen in people's work-life balance, like home or in the office, um, and actually working um, closer to home has created new challenges, but I think that they're being addressed. Um, you know, there are some more, but I, I think that the, how do you put it, the, the openness for taking advantage of the opportunities that are now coming to the fore uh, are being addressed. Okay. 
well. So, still bullish. Um, Ben? Um, So, you spoke of kind of the, uh, one of the reasons you you like the town is the potential for, I guess, new development or new opportunities. Um, I guess if you were on a member of the planning board or, or just as a resident, what are some strategies that you think could be used to try to balance that economic growth and development with kind of preserving the town's character and also providing like I guess the key um, public services to the to the existing community without overtaxing kind of the system so I think that uh, well and this goes back to kind of the change in um, dynamic of people tending to work more closer to where they live so um, that's also creating a, a movement which you know you see in home values and demand for people to have their businesses outside of outside of dense areas and that's um, with the amount of plant that we have so the amount of infrastructure that's already built commercial infrastructure that's already built being able to utilize those um, being able to utilize uh, that infrastructure uh, I think is very important um, Unmuted. but then to also take advantage of the desire for more I guess for inflow of people uh, to Citra, I'm not saying, oh, let's make it a megapolis or anything like that. That has to still be smooth, but um, that's where the un unseen portions of uh, the utilities, strengthening the electrical grid, um, or at least figuring out how to do that, the both you know, figuring out our water issues, both drinking water, tap water, and sewer water, and having the capacity to be able to handle the the fact that people are living or are working and spending more time at home. It also raises the issue of, and we've unfortunately seen some of the negative effects of it recently. Um, some of our roadways and the ability to or the understanding that with more people um, working closer to home you're going to actually have a, a flatter sorry for the reference but a flatter curve of traffic during the day instead of a you know a morning spike and uh, you know in an after work spike of traffic you're going to have more traffic during the day when Previously, the roads might have been safer to travel on. Now they're not. So using the existing roadways, uh, figuring out ways to incorporate safety measures um, along them, whether that's taking a look at some of the speed limits or you know, having wider roads that could potentially have uh, bicycle lanes on the outside or sidewalks so I don't there's no I guess let me know if I'm if I'm hitting the right point or to answer your question because uh, I've gone on for a bit but um, I don't think that the town doesn't need to change its face you know very much to um, to accommodate the growth and the the different ways that we're living now but with the existing things that we have, improvements on those are, won't change the look of the town as much as it will strengthen what we have already. Thanks. So I'm interested in um, how you feel about a retreat from the ocean. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> a managed retreat. Yeah, yeah, a little philosophical type thing. Uh, well, so on the, um, I think I'm, I was looking at the um, the working group 
uh, presentation. It's the one that was orange and black. Sustainability. Yeah. Sustainability. Mm -hmm. And one of the, you know, the number one asset is the ocean. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, the ocean's a cruel mistress. You know, it's a home wrecker. You know, we can't really control it. So, um, I don't. I, now, this is speaking for myself, not from any kind of official government yep. point of view, but I don't know if a retreat is necessary, um, but we do have to accept the fact that we live in a town with a sandy coastline, so erosion is a, is a major point, and uh, we will have to deal with it or yes you can retrieve for the from the ocean i wouldn't recommend putting up a casino on the beach here or anything like that <laughs> not that that would happen but you know i wouldn't i wouldn't i don't believe in you know necessarily the expansion of it but i i do think that you know the the sands of time will you know we're they're going to come back up and up and down this part of the coastline um you know, for instance, you know, we're dredging out the, the inlet on the North and South River mm -hmm. because the spit is trying to get back down to Hummerock that, you know, was knocked out in the Portland Gale. So, and I'm not saying that we, you know, that would be bad, we should let the spit grow back to Hummerock and start, you know, dealing with reclaimed land from that marsh area, but, uh, it's just something we have to be aware of and accept. Uh, that being said, for some of the houses that are in um, more sandy and that are more susceptible to larger storms, um, one of them I think being just south of the lighthouse on, what was that, a second cliff or first mm -hmm. cliff, we have to be aware of that if those, you know, if there's a wash over on that barrier into the harbor where the harbor could be in trouble. And my thought on that is something that I saw firsthand down in Chatham, in Chatham Harbor, where in Chatham Light, the lighthouse <clears throat> in 1987, uh, I don't remember what storm it was, but it was a nor'easter and it, it rolled right over the barrier beach, which was Nosset Beach in Monomoy and it, just took 60 feet of of the Chatham Harbor wash houses in. So managed retreat, not necessarily, I mean, I wouldn't recommend in encouraging more building in those areas, but um, I think acceptance and mitigation of what uh, the possibility, real possibilities. Well, it's, um, we have a lot on our plate. That's good. We do. We are incredibly busy. Yeah. And as Steve was saying before to another individual, all of us sitting here have been alternates. And then we are now board members. And it's, it's an important position. We need all the input we can get, all the help we can get. And we listen to what everyone and anyone has to say, and we can all agree to disagree, come to some type of whatever consensus to move forward. Do you have any questions for us? No, not uh, not right now as it relates okay. to it. Um, reading over everything is very interesting, very interesting, and. I'd, like to keep up. Have you ever watched any of the meetings on YouTube? Yes, I have. <laughs> that in and of itself would put you to sleep. My favorite are the selectmen's <laughs> meetings, though. You guys, <laughs> playing board's a little bit drier than the selectmen's <laughs> meetings with some of the characters. I, know, I miss going to those meetings. Yeah, we used to go to those, yeah, we I used to go those. all the time and whatever. But um, if you are not selected, would you still be interested? in getting on a committee in some way, shape, or form? Absolutely. Please do if this doesn't go forward, okay? Definitely. It's important. We need we need younger people. We do. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm not that young anymore, but no. I'm just no, <laughs> no. 
But I'm here You're for the long haul, I and I, you know, I'm, I'm besides a personal interest in, you know, giving the best possible, you know, opportunities for my own family. It's, you know, it's some place that. This Love it or hate it, you're right. stuck with me. This is this is a very special town, and a lot of people. We can't leave. God knows why, but we can't. We're here yeah. for the duration. I've been here almost 50 years. Long time, but I'll never be a townie, and that's not a bad thing. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Ben's our only townie. What? Ben's our only townie. You are our only townie. Thank you. Actually, he could be a native. Did Your you mother? graduate from Citroen High School? I did. You were telling me. But Ben's parents, from, his mother's from here too. That, that generational thing. Such an exciting meeting. Okay, our last individual is Christian Putnam. First one in. Where's the first one here? Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. So if you could, uh, I know you've been waiting a long time. No worries. Just introduce yourself and tell us why you are interested in being on the planning board. Sure. Absolutely. Christian Putnam. Um, and I'm interested because I, I love Citruit. I've lived here since 1994, with the exception of a few years down in New York City due to some work changes. Um, and I, I, um, I believe that our town is a very special resource, right? It has so many very unique properties to it. It has the water, it has the fishing fleet, it has just beautiful trails, and a character that is very quintessential New England. And in my view, part of giving back to the community is helping to preserve what the history is, but at the same time, have some smart development and some economic development and movement forward. Okay. All right, I'll open it up to questions from my members. Um, Mr. Pritchard, question from Mr. Putnam. Uh, yeah, well, um, so what do you see? You've been here a long time, so that, that's, uh, you've seen a lot happening since 1994. Um, what do you see are the particular uh, biggest challenges for the town uh, going forward? And what do you see as uh, maybe what our, our biggest weaknesses are? Okay. Um, so in terms of the challenges, I mean, I think many of them are self-evident, right? I mean, there's been in, in terms of planning as a community, we have not always been as forward looking as we should be. And I think we see that through the fresh water supply and the challenges there. We see it through the challenges with sewage. Uh, I was reading in the 2004 master plan, and I don't remember the numbers exactly, but it was something like 75 to 85 percent of the town does not have appropriate soil for private septic systems, and only, I don't know, 30 percent of the town has sewers. That's, that's a challenge right there, and that's a weakness for the, for the, for the town, and it, it's something that needs to be dealt with. I think the other challenges are uh, maintaining the character of the town, right? I think it would be very easy for Situate to turn into a town that does not have the, the character of, that it does today. Uh, so, so I think that's a challenge as well. And then, you know, in terms of weaknesses, I suppose it's true everywhere. We live in a, in a world of limited resources, and uh, life is triage in a way, so you have to make decisions around how resources are spent and what the best payoff is for the town overall and, and how to be smart about that so that we don't end up 50 years down the road with some, I don't know, internet crisis and we don't know what to do with our data that we can't get rid of or whatever, something that we're not thinking about now. Obviously, I'm making that up and it's a little bit flipped, but does that help? Yes. 
Steve? Yes, uh, I, I appreciate that. And um, I'm just uh, curious in terms of maintaining the character of the town, um, how do you see that, how, how would you manifest that? Do you see it as changes to to uh, zoning bylaws, as design criteria, as, uh, I just, I'm just curious yeah. how you would think about it. Yeah. About doing that. No, that's that's a great question. So, so I think there is an element of, of zoning bylaws and an element of uh, certain restrictions around the way development is carried out. But I think also it's important to have access to a working waterfront. For example, I, I think it, personally, I think it would be terrible if there were no fishing boats tied up at the at the town pier. Right. I think that that is a lot of the character of our. Of our town, and sure, they don't always smell that great, but that's they've been around for 300 years, right? So that's they, they get to smell that way, um, and so so I think part of that is making sure that there's access and the ability for those small business people to run their their small businesses. That's just one example, um, and and you know, as far as uh, getting away from the water or maybe different parts of the water, there has to be open space and there has to be access for people to get to it so for example the property that the the town is uh, looking at buying over by I'm forgetting the name of it but right at the Cohasset line where there's a mill that's very historical that type of, of action by the town and we just bought it it just bought it right it was that town meeting as I recall and I appreciated you moving the motion on one of the <laughs> But I'm job. <laughs> one of the one of the items uh, so I, and and so the town has to be active at that right I mean you hear you hear people complaining about the proving ground well if the town doesn't buy it then there's only so much you can do you either own it or you zone it yeah. exactly yeah. exactly well put I like that all right Ben thank you thank you um, I guess what are some of your maybe some of your favorite things are think are the most positive qualities of the town and then uh, on the flip side what are also some negative things or things that you think uh, leave room for improvement and kind of slanted towards the zoning and planning sure sure yeah so you know the interesting thing about the town is if you look back at the population over the years it's been right around 18,000 for decades and decades yes. Right, but we continue to get bigger and bigger houses with fewer and fewer people in them, and uh, so I think that is a challenge to a certain extent because you could end up with, and I won't disparage another town, but you could end up with McMansions that are outside the character of, of what we're looking at all through town, right? And, and you see it happen. You see homes being torn down and and very different things going in, and that's going to happen. I certainly understand that. Uh, but I think, again, you have to be smart about how you do that and try to keep some of the same characteristics so that you know that you're in situate as opposed to West Palm Beach. Apologies to anybody who winters in West Palm. <laughs> well, you're all winter. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't left town. No, yeah. We're here. I hear you. We're, we're all here right now. So, so I think that's part of it, is, is ensuring even with development that um, that the characteristics of a New England town that is 300 years old are being maintained. Does that does that help and answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. and what, what, what would you say are some positive? Because ah. I guess that's <laughs> yeah, we missed that. <laughs> so, so I think you know, in terms of positive, I, and that's kind of where I was going with the initial part of the answer. It's it's nice that the town is not growing. Right, it's not growing in terms of population, particularly since we have an infrastructure that really can't handle a lot more people, in, in my opinion, right now. Um, I think that, that what we have in terms of the Harbor District, in terms of Greenbush, and eventually North Situate again, in terms of those village clusters, I think are very special. And I, I live down in Minot, and I remember when there was a little store down in Minot, and it had that feel about it. And, and I have to tell you, the residents missed that little store that was down there as to the kids that could get their ice cream and all that. So I think there are, you know, there's, there's more to 
the town than just any one area. It's a, it's a collection of areas that offer so much to not only the residents, but those who come and visit as well. All right, Rebecca? Um, my question is, what um, background experience do you have that you would help the planning board? Yeah, so that's, I think that's an excellent question. And, and I'm not an architect, I'm not a civil engineer, obviously. I'm none of those things, um, right? So I'm, I'm a finance background and, and basically a sales guy. But it, in that role, I have over 30 years, and a friend of mine tells me you don't get any more credit than 20 years when you give your resume, so forget about the first 10 or whatever. You don't, why bring it up? Um, but but I have I have many years of helping organizations and people with complex challenges and coming up with innovative solutions and that's the way I've I've made my living and made my reputation in business that I'm able to to walk into CFOs and CEOs of major corporations and, and get a get a, a hearing as it were and it's that same type of innovative thinking that I think I can bring and the the appreciation for history. So uh, one of the things I didn't mention is I'm a lifetime member of the Wellfleet Historical Society, the Orleans Historical Society. I don't think Situate has lifetime membership. I'm trying to figure that out. The email doesn't work, but whatever, I'm, I'm learning. Um, so, you know, there's that appreciation for history. And, and my family's been here since the 1600s in the New England area out on the Cape. And, and that sense of, of where we came from, I think, is important when we're thinking about where we're going. I hope that answers your question, Rebecca. And I have a daughter named Rebecca, by the way. Thank you. Okay. So um, will you be open to supporting changes, such as our new zoning bylaws, which can start to expand as, you know, um, and, and what do you think are important validations as to why we have zoning bylaws? Well, we we have to change, right? We can't we can't live the way we did in the 1920s to pick a decade. Clearly, we have to change as a society. We have to change as a town in order to continue to be vibrant and to grow. So, so absolutely, I would be supportive of those, and I think that is something that is uh, that change and reconsideration of what the zoning bylaws are, and I, I'm not familiar with what the proposed changes were, I wish I, I wish are, I wish I were, um, but yeah, I, I think we absolutely have to change. I mean, we can't live our lives thinking that things will never change within the town. They, they should and they have to, and but it should will. be positive. And they will, and because they will. we're not going to stop it. Mm -hmm. right? No, it's um, the alternate position, as I've said to the other candidates, we've all been alternates at one time or another. And we expect full participation. If five of us are, if the initial five are here and there's a vote, you can't vote, but your input is valued, okay? Very valued. Um, do you have any questions for us? So you answered one of my questions because I didn't quite understand what alternate means, but it sounds like it's a little bit of a training ground for perhaps Absolutely. becoming a full ground yes. board member. Um, I guess my question would be, what's the time commitment? And just on average. Every, the second, how does it go? The second and fourth? The second and fourth Thursdays. Um, right. And then usually some of the members are liaisons to other committees. Sure. So, and so whenever you need to do the prep for the meeting, and we can, we're very busy right now, so. I noticed. Busy. <laughs> busy. Yeah, um, okay. That's, that's helpful. That's what I expected. Okay, and. There's a lot of reading. <laughs> yes, a lot of reading. And we want you to comment, and we want you to participate. In other words, no shrinking violets. Trust me, I'm not shy. That is a good thing. <laughs> okay. All right, well, thank you very much. And one other thing, if you are not selected, would you please consider getting on another committee? Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Excellent. That's that's part of the plan. Good. So if, Excellent. If, well, 
if I'm not selected, that's part of the plan. But the plan <laughs> is to be selected, clearly. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but thank you for your time. I appreciate thank it. You. And thank you for, your, for what you do for the town. Oh, well, thank Sincerely you. appreciate it. All right. Thanks I'll so let much. you get to your old business then. <laughs> this old business walk out the door. Oh, all right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I lost my agenda. I have it right here. Um, we have minutes. Minutes. Okay. Okay. So I'll put this on the agenda for next time for you guys to make a decision. Yes. Okay. Please. <laughs> I move to approve the me meeting minutes for August 27, 2020. Second. Second. All in favor? Mr. Ryan. Aye. Ms. Morenstein. Aye. Ms. Lambert. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. Aye. Ms. Lewis. Aye. Thank you, unanimous. Counting. I move to approve the requisition of $3,020 to Chester Consulting for the peer review of 48 to 52 new driftway and gas backwards for $176.40 to Gatehouse Media for the legal ad for 48 to 52 new driftway for five hundred and ten dollars to horse we went for the peer review services for fourteen to sixteen old country way. Second. Thank you. All in favor. Ms. Burbine. Aye. Mr. Bornstein. Aye. Ms. Lambert. Aye. Mr. Fritcher. Aye. Ms. Lewis. Aye. Thank you. All in favor. Meeting schedule. Holiday. November, December. So on the meeting schedule, you're scheduled to meet November 12th, and technically we don't have another meeting in November. Um, there's the, we could meet the 19th or the 24th. 24th is the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, the 19th is the week before. Where we're having a little trouble getting meeting rooms for those. Um, we could throw in November 5th. December, we're meeting December 10th, and then we are in the same situation. We don't have another meeting scheduled because of the holidays. We could throw in an extra meeting on December 3rd so that you get your two meetings in the month. We are remaining very busy, and um, we've, got, we've got a lot on our plate, so I just need to know what you guys want to do for your schedule. Could you um, repeat November? November we have the 5th well, or the 12th? We have the 12th. That's a definite meeting. And we, okay. have, we have December 10th. Those are definite meetings. We don't have a second no. meeting yet in November because of the holidays and same for December. We can easily get a room on the first Thursday of every month. But it's harder as we get in later in the month to get another room. Are you guys willing to meet um, two weeks in a row so that we can move some of this stuff along and get it done? Well, I prefer the 19th over the 24th, I'd have to say. Of November? Yeah. No, but there's always the option of everyone being remote and we do a Zoom. Mm -hmm. So but Zoom requires everyone has to be remote. We yeah. can't do a hybrid like this <coughs> where we have some people here and some people there. So and we can't get the nineteenth of a room. I we I I don't know that we can get this room, which we have to be taped. Right. So um, if we need it live, we have to be in this room. If we don't need it live, then we can probably see if we can get the EOC. But EOC would probably be the next room available. But actually, we have the EOC for the 19th. Oh, I thought you told me we didn't have it. No, we do have it. Oh, okay. What, what did Steve say? You'd rather do the 9th, the 24th? No, I'd rather do the 19th. Oh, yeah, me too. Or you do the 5th. Or December 5th. November 5th. November 5th. I'm not going anywhere, so it doesn't I'm matter. I'm not going anywhere. You going anywhere, Ben? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're Maybe. I might. All right. You never know. All right, we'll do the 5th of November 
and the 12th. And then we'll deal with December 12th. Do you want to have a second meeting in December? We need one, don't we? We have to move some stuff uh, away. What did you say, Karen? We need to have a second meeting. Would you be willing to meet December 3rd and December 10th? Sure. Steve. December 3rd and December 10th? Yes. December 10th is already a scheduled meeting for the board, so the change is on December 3rd. <clears throat> so we'll, have, we'll go from the 12th to the 3rd and then the 10th. Yes. Yes. I have to do that. Okay. Perfect. That's done. All right. So November 5th, November 12th, November 16th is town meeting. Yeah. December 3rd, December 10th, we're going to ask, uh, we're going to be on with a joint meeting with the Board of Selectmen for um, October 6th to decide um, to do the roll call vote for the alternate member. Are they doing all well Zoom? They're doing all well Zoom. All well Zoom. Yeah. So you just have to stay at home and log on and they'll roll call the, the vote. Okay. Okay. All right. So, liaison reports. Who's liaison in here? Uh, anybody? Not much. Is no. Oh, no, no. Rebecca? No? I mean, CPC is having their annual meeting Monday night, which is supposed to be long. Um, traffic rules meets Tuesday night. So, that's what's what. Okay, how about planning and development, Karen? Uh, I sent you all an email today that I'd like a response on, on the Senior Center. Um, they proposed kind of not to do this parking monitoring plan. So I'm interested in your individual feedback that I can put a response um, together. So you mean they just don't want to do it? Or? Too expensive. Too expensive. Too expensive. Yep. Yeah. How much is it? I. Is that in the note? No, it's not in the note. So I need what you want me to ask them for that for the information. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell them it's um, you can't just change a condition without coming back to the board. That's correct. They're thinking they can just do, not do the parking monitoring plan and build the 16 spaces. So if you could look at that email, I really would appreciate it so we could get a response as soon as um, I can get something out to try to keep on top of it. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I think in any event, if they're proposing a change to the condition, then, then we'd have to put them on the agenda somewhere to discuss it, right? I agree. I think there's lots of changes going on up there. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Yep. You think what? Lots, lots of changes going on up there that we don't know anything about. Changes to our conditions? Building, sight lines, yeah, all kinds of stuff. I think personally I do, yeah. Well, there are some changes going on. I mean, um, that have you know from other stuff. Um, for instance, they had to change the access to the historical society stuff. Um, but no one's. I mean, it's in the weekly reports I get. But other than that, I don't know what the change is. So, if they could just are, are they are they coming to you with these changes? No, no. Well, I would say that um, this parking could be one, but if there are other changes, we should make sure we address address them as well. And 
Right, I agree with you. That's kind of why I want just everybody's first reaction so I can put an email together and send it out. All right. What else, Karen? Um, as you see, we are remaining very busy. Um, you know, we're trying to do one major, one major thing a night, but then we fill up with other minor things that have to be dealt with. So um, that's kind of the way it's going. Um, you know, you have three special permits before you now, and um, it's it's busy. It's busy, and there's it's a lot of work to. Uh, to get all the information presented to the board so that you guys can ask your questions, etc. So, um, I, you know, that's enough said on that. Um, I have been working all week on a draft decision for 14 to 16 Old Country Way, and um, now that I have some input from you, I can further work on it, so we'll be getting you a first draft that I will need feedback on. All right, are you, okay. are you all set, Karen? I'm set enough, yeah. Okay. All right, um, after we adjourn, do you, Rebecca, can you and Steve stick yeah, around? Huh? I asked Steve for this to tell about. We're all set? Okay, I'll entertain. Rebecca, just stay on the line. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Oh, Mr. Burbank. Aye. Mr. Bornstein. Aye. Ms. Lambert. Aye. Mr. Pritchard. Aye. Ms. Lewis. Aye. Thank you. Meeting's adjourned.